One, two, three. Welcome to Skilt Up. My name is Joe Austin. And if you're a regular visitor, a regular watcher of Skilt Up, you know that we try to bring to you people who are interesting, who have a different, maybe a quirky different journey of life, people who are inspiring. When we were doing the research over this last week on my guest today, one of the researchers came back and said, this woman is a book. She's not an interview. So my <laughs> guest is Siobhan McCullum. She is a poet. She is a former teacher. She is a mother, a sister. She is someone who is known and feared, I have to say, by many of the early morning shock jocks that we have on, <laughs> on, the, more, on the more established video. And she's someone who will take you through a journey. What I'm going to do is sit back like the rest of us and just enjoy it. So Siobhan, thank you. And I know you've interrupted your holiday. So I appreciate that. Coramila Melgut, thank you. Coramila Melgut, Joe. I'm a super fan from Skelta has started recording, to be honest with you. For people like me, it's really been a way of being included in society again. And the move to online has really like made me feel included again. There's been so many things that have been positive about the pandemic for people like me. But for so many, they've struggled. And I guess I've kind of had a few years experience of being housebound prior to the lockdown, which has given me that bit of insight. And I've tried to share that little bit of it wisdom throughout the pandemic. And it gave me a wee bit of confidence to sort of believe in myself again and to share that wisdom of what it's like to be housebound or bedbound through illness. And I guess many people have been um, lost what they see as their daily routine. And I had four years of practice prior to prior to lockdown as to what that means. Well, I want to take you maybe to the beginning of that journey. And I want to I want to bring you through it. And I and I said to you that and you knew this, you'd, you'd already sussed this out before before I confirmed it. That what we do when we when we have a guest, we try and find out bits and pieces about them. And we done the same with you. Uh, and it was amazing. And it will be amazing. And I guarantee for those who have just joined us, you'll be going at the end of this program. My God. You're, you're, uh, you were described by me as someone who, who grew up with you, and that's a big hint as to who said it, as the most inquisitive child that, that ever came across, that was ever invented. And, and I think that that's reflected in your educational ability. So take us through primary school and then into St. Dominic's. Yeah, Joe, I was very lucky. I went to St. Catherine's Primary School just there on the Falls Road. Um, you know, my memories of primary school were that you were loved, you were cared for, you were gifted and talented, and that everybody had something to give. You might not have been the smartest person, but there was something that everybody had to give. And that ethos was sort of instilled into us at a very young age. Um, our, our trips to the library, down the Carnegie Library, are something that was very memorable. And I always think that that's sort of where I felt my first love of learning, going down to that library. And very often, Joe, you were walking through British Army patrols and there may have been rats the night before and there may have been bomb scars or whatever. So, you know, that was the backdrop to what our primary school life was. But when you were in school, it was a very safe and nurturing environment. And I feel very lucky to have gone to that school. I was the only one out of the six of us to pass the 11 plus and I went on to St. Dominic's, but even in St. Catharines, I've always been a visualizer and a dreamer. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing back then. But I used to look at that window, that rose, you know, the rose, the big stained glass window or rose yeah. by any name. And I used to look at that in the playground and say, I'm going to go there. You know, I'm going to go to that school. And then the same thing happened whenever I went to St. Mary's. We used to go over from St. Catharines to the teacher training college. And from a very young age, I used to like dream that I would go there and I did so let me ask you this because that you've led me into to Elena question and um, I know that when you came back every day from primary school that you gave a running commentary on what you had learned who you were talking to what your teacher said uh, who you were fighting with who uh, wasn't, <laughs> talking, who wasn't talking to you and I know you've done this and so it appears to me that from a very early age you had an appetite for education that education yeah. for you wasn't a burden per se. You know, I hate it going to school. The teachers hate it, me going to school. But for you, school seemed to be 
an adventure. Did that lead you on to your teaching career? Definitely, Joe. I got I got a real buzz out of doing exams. You know, I know there's not many people say that. It might sound a bit weird, but I was very competitive. I, I would have like went and studied as hard as I could to prove, I suppose, being from down the road, you were when when I first went to St. Dominic's, that's the first I really became aware of the class difference. You know, you realized that there were people who didn't have the same sort of social background as you, that they had much more sort of better opportunities. They had money to be able to do things. And, you know, it was very different backgrounds to what we had. So books, I had older siblings and fourth out of six. And I was very, very lucky to have those three above me who were all like very good at school, who worked very hard and who basically set that sort of example that school was like a passport, that your education was your way out, that your education was your way of improving life. And I suppose my granny and granda and my mummy and daddy would have been very much the same despite none of them having any formal education, Joe, you know. Can I, can I just let you in your wee family secret? And you talked about the three siblings above you and two below you and, uh, and your mother and father who are gems. I've known them a long time. <laughs> They're absolute gems. And I asked someone and they said, yeah, we were older, but she was the boss. <laughs> I, would have, I would have been a bit of a dictator, Joe. Um, I was always fighting. I was a scrapper. We, well, that's what you do with your older siblings, don't you? You scrap. Um, I think even our background, like your children were my friends. And so we, we played through Bilton sites. The Blackie was our playground. You were going up to the flush. You know, it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. But we made our own fun, you know. We had the crack and banter and life was good despite the horrors that were happening around you. But yeah, I probably was a bit of a dictator um, because I was the baby for seven years and then the two younger ones came and spoiled my happiness. <laughs> so, um, but my older siblings were very good to me and they were always encouraging me. And my mummy and daddy, we, we all would have like been very competitive with quizzes and my mummy used to read the thesaurus to us, like, you know, it wasn't bedtime stories. It was, she was like, you need to know words, words make you smart, you know, that type of mentality. And I suppose my granny and granda, they always encouraged you to do well in school because of what they had suffered and the discrimination that they had experienced, you know. I want to take you through, because it's said when I began, that there's about three books in, in your life story so far. <laughs> and maybe there'll be many more before we get to the end of it, which will be a long Long time on. You're sailing through school. You're in St. Dominic's. You're, you're kind of a, not necessarily fate in your corner, but you're aware that there, there, are, there are differences. There, there are class differences, financial differences, but you're doing okay. You're, you're, you, it, was there a stage where you decided, I am going to be a teacher? Did it, like, was it like that or was it, I don't know what I'm going to be? When I was in primary school, I wanted to go to the college. By the time I started doing my A-levels, I became very politically aware. It was a brilliant time to become politically aware because the Good Friday Agreement was being signed. I was doing A-level politics. And basically, um, when I got my GCSE results, I was probably within the top five in the school. So I always tried to prove myself. But whenever things went well for me, something always bad happened afterwards. And I don't mean bad, but... I was always brought back down to earth, if that makes sense. And so when I returned after my GCSE results, it was like a hero. Um, yeah. And I was pregnant. And I kept it a secret for, for a long ask, time. Let me ask you this, just because I was going to ask you about that, but you, you preempted my question. You were very young, 16, 17? What age were you when you were 17, back? yeah. 17. Uh, 17. And yeah, and then the baby, had, because I'd, I'd sort of hidden it. That's the question, yeah. So you hid the fact I that you were pregnant. I didn't seek medical attention. Um, yeah, uh, so by, by the time I told my parents I was about five months pregnant, um, I was just afraid, Joe. I was a reader in Connacht Monastery. You know, your grandparents had been brought up in a sort of relatively conservative Catholic background, you know, um, we went to Mass every Sunday. I was like the golden girl of Clannard, reading every Sunday, reading at the big novenas, and you were afraid of what the priests were going to say. But actually, Joe, I was I was so loved and I was so looked after. Um, Clannard Monastery will always be my spiritual home. And 
once my mummy and daddy got over that initial shock, it was like, we're not letting you drop out of school. And so I didn't know whether school was going to let me continue. Uh, I had three amazing A-level teachers and they backed me to the hilt. But I do think that I was treated so well because I'd achieved so highly. There were other girls in that situation that didn't get the same level of support that I got. So I, I did feel very lucky that I was surrounded by very good teachers who who sort of fought my corner and said, this girl will succeed and nothing else will happen until she gets to where she needs to go. And I know one of your, one of your, uh, I suppose one of your messages in life is that you don't give advice, you give, you give examples. You lead by example. And I want to talk about MS and, and you mentioned it briefly, you know, to be locked down effectively for, for almost a year, but you know, there, there's someone who'd watch this who's young, who's young. No man can answer this question, by the way. So that's why I'm putting it to you. And you mentioned that the fear of being 17 and pregnant, the fear of what the unknown is, the fear of what's going to happen. You know, there's somebody out there who'll watch this perhaps and will, their daughter or granddaughter uh, will be pregnant at this age. And, and it, it must feel at that age like your world has collapsed. That, that that yeah that the future is mapped out but what would you give them any advice would you give them any kind of sense of what yeah, they so do? I, i've kind of i've had to speak to a few girls in the past who found themselves in similar situations and what i would say to any young girl is you may think it's like a disaster at the time owns now 23 he's a law degree and he's a master's in human rights he was a very very sick baby I sat by his bed in the neonatal. He was in the neonatal for a month. And every day I, I, I bargained with God and said, if you allow this child to live, I'll be the best mother that I can possibly be. And I gave this child as best as I can possibly get him. And I'll do the best job as I can possibly do. And so I think support is very important. And I had that in abundance between my mummy and daddy general family members and even within the community, Joe, I worked for Big Eddie McCloverty and Cavendish Street and like what I remember him always looking after me, you know. Let, let me explain, this is a fish and chip shop in, in Cavendish Street. Yeah, it, tar hot food. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, you know, you people in the community that knew you from a young child and everybody backed me, you know, they said everything's going to be okay. It'll all work out and it did, it did all work out. Can I move you forward? Because as I say, there's so much, so much volume in your in your life. You you became a teacher. Um, someone said that the day you went to school, you could have been mistaken for one of the pupils. You were small, <laughs> kind of very very pale. You looked more frightened than the first year did. Um, yeah. Can you remember that day? Can you remember starting your first day teaching? Yeah, Joe, I was really lucky because I did my teaching practice in St. Catherine's, Holy Child and St. John's Girls. And I was in with teachers who were from West Belfast. So they took a little bit of extra care with me and looked after me. And whenever I went first into Christ the Redeemer, I'd never been with younger children. And I spent my whole career in the foundation stage. And I remember just thinking, oh, my God, how, how am I going to control 30 children? And do you know what? Working with children is the best reward. It's funny. It's great. It can go one way or the other, but you get a great sense of buzz. You know, you get great joy out of it. And there's never a dull moment either, you know. So I was really, really lucky straight into Christ the Redeemer. And I got a permanent job, which was very lucky for to be out with my health problems and whatever else. So luck played a big part in my career as well. I'm not so sure what's it's luck or what it's ability or a combination of both. This made interest you. One of the people that you're writing with said that, that you should write a book about teaching those small children because uh -huh. the stories that you're able to tell and the experiences are is something else. So you're a teacher, you're a mother, you're moving on. And as you said, rather than I said, there's always this like booby trap around the corner. Your health. I think the first thing you had was was it kidney stones at some stage that began yeah. to affect you? It was you? a huge, a huge staghorn stone, Joe, and it was during my final year at St Mary's. As I say, things were always going well, and then something it was like getting the carpet pulled from beneath you. 
on um, Matt Damien whenever it was in the second year college. Let me just um, let, let me explain who Damien is. Damien is your is your husband. Yes, okay. Damien's my husband. He's like compassion personified. Joe, if <laughs> anything went well in my life, it was meeting him. It was like a jackpot lotto when he's just a great guy all round, a brilliant husband, brilliant father, and a great deal. And that has brought great joy throughout suffering. You know, the hurling is what he li lives and breathes for. So I know I play second fiddle to hurl hurling, but I knew what I was marrying. Um, but I got pregnant with Ethan my last year and I had Brian Feeney um, in, in St. Mary's and I did my dissertation in the hospital bed. I was very, very ill. I had a huge, a huge staghorn kidney stone and they couldn't operate until the baby was born. And she was trying to come from 20 weeks or on. So there was a lot of like, very worrying times. Again, another neonatal experience. She's 18, she's thriving. She's fighting my prime ministers, you know. Um, so I'm very, very blessed. But Brian Feeney, he backed me whenever, you know, I missed quite a lot of time in my final year. But because I had did so well in third year, he said, no, she'll complete her year this year as long as she hands in everything that she needs to hand in. And I did my dissertation on the rise of Sinn Féin in the 1918 election from a hospital bed. So again, I just, things, when they were going wrong, they went right, even though they were going wrong, if that makes sense. It made it interesting to know that, that uh, and you, you've, you've kind of, you've glossed over that period about being pregnant, having these giant kidney stones. Yeah. People thought you were going to die. Do you know that? Yeah, I do. And I, I, I thought that myself at times, Joe. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really, I, I bounced back. I was always very positive in my mindset. And I think, again, that comes down to being with somebody like Damien, who is a hurling coach, but he's also like living with a life coach because he has that winning mentality. He's always sort of seeing the glass half full and encouraging me to get up and push on. And if you fall, fall forward, you know, that type of advice is like uplifting when you're very ill. And I was... After a couple of years, I left the tripsies and keyhole surgeries. I spent 13 weeks in the hospital and the kidney had to go. And it was it was very, very difficult. But Joe, I could see the Black Mountain from, from the, the window. And I used to look, and I don't know, nobody taught me to do this, but I'd look and pretend I was at the top of the Black Mountain and imagine all the happiest memories of childhood and sometimes some of the sad ones or the difficult ones that you don't really want to surface but that was a coping technique in the hospital. And I think that all of those hospital experiences have enabled me to cope with what has came now, you know. So it was like laying the, the ground, if you wish, um, to being able to cope with what would come now, which is the ME. And, and I have to say this about you, and you mentioned Clannard and you mentioned your involvement with Clannard Monastery, and you've always had a love of Clannard Monastery. Um, your experiences yep. with the clergy hasn't always been good. And one of the worst was actually in the hospital. I don't know if you want to mention it or not in terms of a, a yeah. of the body base. But can I just say this? Uh, you, ha you have a spiritual understanding rather, if that's an interpretation, rather than a religious understanding. Does that come from... Maybe you should tell the example of the of this confrontation with the local priest. But is it yeah. does it come from that? Um, a bit of both, Joe. I think I was always deeply spiritual. I don't know how I've managed to always keep that faith. I, I do I have a great faith. Um, despite maybe not being what I would describe as a Catholic. I, I I'm still a Catholic at my core. I say Catholic prayers, but there's so much about the Catholic Church that I can't agree with, um, especially LGBT rights. I've got a gay brother, so it just doesn't sit right with me how some people have been treated and the abuse scandals. But basically, I was about five and a half stone. I was current. I was getting a blood transfusion, and this chaplain came um, to come and sort of give me some sort of guidance or spiritual teaching while I was in hospital. And as I was talking, I was explaining that I taught in Christ the Redeemer and that I had two children and. Damien was a great man and he was like are you married and I said no and he started calling he said you're a sinner I can't give you anything you're a sinner and like it was really nasty and 
to me, no man of God or nobody who portrays himself as a man of God can treat any sick person or any vulnerable person like that. The sister of the ward had to come and run him out of the ward. And later that evening, five of the Clonard priests came over, including Father Jerry Reynolds, and they gave me the sacrament of the sick. They blessed me. They told me, listen, that's not God. What you experienced today, that's not God. And we love you. You're a very special girl. It doesn't matter what, you know, transgressions you may have had. You're loved. We care for you. So Clonard will always be a very special place. But that that really did shake me, Joe. It made me, it, it made me lose part of my religion, but I became deeper involved in my spirituality because to me, God is everything. God is everywhere. The universe, you know, some people say God, some people say the universe, but I'm a deep, deep believer that, you know, you're surrounded by God, if you wish, and that everything that happens to you or through you will be what's meant to happen to you. I love the phrase in one of your other interviews that I that I, I, I came across, that you were a, pl- a plastic Catholic. I thought that was a yeah. great, great, a great phrase. Yeah, I suppose, Joe. I think that if you if you go to many homes, and I think particularly here in the north, I don't think religion really ever was part of anything. I think religion was used to you know to be to identify this side or that side. But I think if you go to most homes now, people don't want to be identified as Catholic or Protestant. You know, they want to be identified. You know, what your aspirations are don't necessarily affiliate with religion. If that makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah, no, of course it does. So I, you're back out of hospital, and it's one of your many stays in hospital outside of being there for pregnancies and all of that. But you're out of hospital, you're getting a wee bit better. Um, I suspect that everybody around you, including yourself, thought, no, this is me. Nothing else can go wrong. Nothing else is going to happen. But unfortunately, it did. So, so MS, tell me about that. ME, sorry, Joe. Sorry, it's, ME, I beg your pardon. It's it's basically, um, it's a chronic illness. It's invisible. Um, I took sepsis and I thought that like all of the other times, a period of recovery, look after yourself, build yourself up, exercise, slowly get better. And it wasn't, it was, I started to fall, I fell in the shower, damaged my face, broke fingers, burnt myself and... The doctor said to me, I think it might be post-viral syndrome after the sepsis. And then things didn't improve and things got worse. And the more I would try and push to get better, the more debilitated I became. And I mean, like Joe, in a bed, not able to move, not able to do anything, brushing the teeth, couldn't do that. You know, relying on Damien or Aoife to do everything. And it became a very dark a dark time because I was so frustrated because I saw myself as this fighter who, you know, despite my says, could overcome anything and would fight back. And this time it just it didn't happen. And so for four years, it was very, very difficult being in that bed. Um, the longest period was eight and a half months of not really seeing anybody. I remember meeting you one day in Kennedy Center and bent in your ear. And one of the things that I, I, I started to feel really embarrassed about having a walking stick or not being able to like walk properly or you know when people see you parking in a a disabled bay you don't look sick so you tend to get like people giving you the evils but they don't really understand so this it's a bit like a car running with the, the petrol light on you're always in empty mode you know you don't know how long you're going to get before you're back in the bed Um, But I did have an experience in June 2019, a terrible admission. And when I got out of hospital, it got to the stage where I had to actually ask for help. Damien was struggling. Social workers were involved. OT came in. Uh, Fran McCann uh, was very, very good to me. And another man, Lane Mackle, because it had a really, really traumatic admission. And they came out to the house. And basically, I submitted Joe. And once I submitted and surrendered and sort of said, right, I can't do this. I can't deal with it. I need you all to deal with it. That's when I started to 
get a bit better. I started acceptance liberated me, if that makes sense. You mentioned earlier on, and and I have, as I say, as part of the research for this conversation, we, we would have trawled different interviews that you've done and uh, different rows that you started with DJ. <laughs> I know you didn't start out of the only joke. <laughs> but you always mentioned the strength of Damien. You always mentioned that Damien, yep. um, the kind of quiet hero. Now, I've never met Damien per se, per se. I didn't realize the answer per se. But there was a period where you thought your mind was gone. I mean, you were physically sick, okay. Yeah. But the battle to try and, and keep yourself, your head together, uh, must have been intense. Uh, and you say that without Damien, you couldn't have done that. So yeah. was, was it very much, and, and I know that at the end of it, you can't away were of the view, look, you used to it. I, I'm, I'm not well, and I can't do it. But was there a period where without each other, you wouldn't have got through? Joe, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know what I'd do without that man. And I'm, I'm really being serious when I say he is a hero. He is an unsung hero. I know anybody that knows him knows how dedicated and committed he is to the GAA. And he actually had to take a bit of time out because I had got so ill. Um, they were leaving in the morning and I was in bed for maybe 12, 13 hours. Despite living in Lurgan, our lives were never in Lurgan. So yeah. the kids all play for St. John's. They went to Bunskull Football First Year, St. Mary's and St. Dominic's. You know, life's always been Belfast. The club has been our life. You know, that's it, the GAA is a way of life. Yeah. And he, I took pneumonia and he had to take a bit of time out from coaching. And I could see he was struggling because he just couldn't. He was looking at me and I was lying in a bed 24-7 locked in nearly there were days I couldn't even converse um so they would read me stories like Damien would read me you know WB Yates or Lady Gregory the furry the furry stories or you know myth, myth, Irish mythology and Joe in those stories you get great strength because there's so much sorrow in them and even our own history of the troubles and you know our own community I've got great strength and solace out of looking to that and when you see people being able to get up and push on and the suffering that they've endured, it gives you the strength to say, I can do it too. You know, it might be a diff completely different thing with a health battle, but I've got great, great strength from looking at the examples throughout Irish history. And I think I'm really lucky that history was a passion. So Damien would read me books and um, he would say, look, write down three words. If you can hold a pen today, write down three positive words. Find a reason, not an excuse. You know, focus on what you can do instead of what you can't do. Um, you know, look around you. You've got me. I love you. No matter what, I'm not going anywhere. You've got your children. Don't be worrying. We're not going anywhere. So you start to count your blessings. And as you count your blessings, you realize you've got more than what you actually think. And so I guess he is an unsung hero. So I'm very, very lucky. I also have to say uh, your mother during this period uh, in terms of just providing, I think mothers are far, in many ways, mothers are, are far stronger than fathers, you know, because they do all the practical stuff. But your mother was invaluable at this time. So we just need to give her, yeah. give her a wee bit of a thumbs up. Joe, Gail and Con, they, they, they actually... They start fights with me, right? Now this sounds this sounds wired up. Let me stop you there. Let me stop you. Let me stop you. They said exactly the same about you. Yeah, they say we start fights. They, they, they see that wee girl, where is she? You know, to try and find that girl that they've witnessed throughout life fight and stand up. And they found it really difficult as if I think that because it's such a difficult illness to understand, I started to think. They think I've thrown the towel in. So my daddy would ring me and say, come on, get the music on, put a bit of Sam Cooke on, you know, get the, get what makes you happy. So you have to find ways of raising your vibration. And so I would have discos in the bed. I wouldn't see nobody for 13 hours. The kids and they would be away seven in the morning, maybe not back the nine. And my daddy would say, have a disco in the bed. So if I was only wiggling my toe, I was still having a disco. And even though I physically wasn't able to dance, 
my vibrations. I was imagining I was dancing. I was pretending in my mind that I was dancing. And those techniques are what have got me to where I am now, which is a bit more stable. And the writing has definitely helped with that as well. I want to come to the writing. and Because the writing is such a, a therapeutic part of your life. And the writing is part of your recovery. And you have this ethos in your own thinking, educate that you may be free. So learn from everything. So whether it's whether it's Amy, whether it's learn how to disco dance in a bed. I think I can <laughs> disco dance in a bed, but that's right. <laughs> but whatever it may be, you have a passion for reading. Um, and does that come from that period? where you were kind of locked into your own body or were you always interested in reading? Joe, my, I loved reading. My mummy loves reading. My sisters love reading. Um, loved history. <clears throat> um, but one of the things that Damien was very good at again was providing me with literature that would help uplift. So I remember when I was in for the 13 weeks, a book called Chicken Soup to the Soul. Um, and it's all, all about how your mindset can overcome any illness, be it cancer, be it ME, whatever it is. And so I started saturating myself with literature that was uplifting, that was empowering, that would help me cope with illness, but give me techniques and strategies that would allow me to find joy despite being in pain all day, every day. And, and the pain still there, but I've just found a way of transcending the pain. And so the writing... When I'm writing, I'm trying to write things that I would like to say if I was still in my classroom or wisdom I want to share with my children. And so that's where the, the drive comes to write down things, to try and continue that passion of passing on knowledge or sharing knowledge or imparting wisdom. And so it's like, instead of watching Steve, listening to Stephen Nolan, because that was when me up, Brexit became it sort of coincided with my um, illness. And so I was listening to the news every day, Joe, and it was making me feel crap. So I started listening to good things. You know, I'm putting on um, all these like fantastic spiritual teachers like Picnic uh, Han, um, mm -hmm. Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra. And instead of focusing on negative, I started focusing on well-being and, you know, as I say, counting your blessings, gratitude. When you place gratitude at the centre, no matter how difficult or challenging you think life is, you can find joy, you can be happy. And it doesn't matter if you're not able to go out and take a walk. You can find it in other things. Like, you know, just even like, I'm looking now, there's flowers there with roses. Looking at a rose, feeling it, touching it, smelling it. You find joy in the very, very small things. But the greatest thing is, is when I am able to get out and sit beside Patty A at a hurling match and watching the kids become like demigods, swinging their hurls and moving their bodies in ways you never thought possible. And that's where you get great joy. And yeah. one day out is enough to sustain you for maybe six weeks. So I, I also asked somebody about you sitting on the sideline watching a hurling match and they said, <laughs> It would take 10 referees to stop her shouting. <laughs> so you must no, be, well, that's one thing. You must be sure the instructions. <laughs> uh, well, Joe, I, sorry, well, I told you about, Luke, I lost my voice for a year. Yeah, So I from I lost my voice, I had to get the throat surgery. So I'm not allowed to shout at matches. So when the kids hear me shouting, they give me the evils. Or if Damien hears me carrying on badly, you know, it's like, don't be getting on like one of them, Maz. Get back into your box. <laughs> You're embarrassing us. <laughs> you have developed, and you mentioned that certain uh, shock jock, uh, that morning program. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but, but you know, you were not at all shy and ringing and challenging and, and defending people's rights and defending all of that. You've always been a defender of those who have who have a need to be defended. And you mentioned your brother have been gay and you're very proud of him, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. Is that where your support for the LGBT community comes from? Or would you have always been a supporter? So where does it where does it arrive at? 
do I think being from West Belfast, you, you, you always stand on the side of the oppressed. You always back people that are sort of marginalised. And now I am a marginalised woman because people with disability don't really get, you know, this is a great opportunity for me today, which I'm grateful for. So I, in my job, I, despite all the ill health, I was very lucky to be head of PDMU. And within that, I implemented the Right to Respect in School Board. You need to explain what that means, because I know, but some of our viewers... So, there, so there's a UNICEF award based on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so rights were something I was always very passionate about. Um, whenever, just before I had to retire, I'd been promoted to head of PDMU. And it was like the dream job because you were getting to work on well-being, emotional intelligence, implementing rights, promoting rights, and starting up for diversity, inclusivity, you know, and 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 trying to move the play, the world into a better place, moving and steering the community and empowering them through understanding rights. And I, th I felt really passionate about it. So I, I, I'm writing a little bit about that at the minute. Um, I don't know whether it'll ever go anywhere, but it's keeping me happy. I'm enjoying it, you know, and, and if I could do something along those lines to promote rights for children, that's something that I'm passionate about. You come from uh, and you endorse trade unionism very strongly and you, and you talk about those trade unionists who stood by you during that period when you were ill and you couldn't teach and all of that. And we're, we're in the Conley Centre, no better place than talk yeah. about, to talk about trade unionism. Are you still as are you still as strong a supporter of trade unionism as you, as you had been during that that dark period? Definitely, Joe. Um, Mark McTaggart, Paddy McAllister, those two men, what they did for me, I'll never forget. They're both in the INTO. Um, medical retirement is very very challenging to deal with, but when you're sick and vulnerable, you can't deal with those things. You have to let other people step in. And like no better men to step in and fight for your rights. You know, they really are inspirational heroes. Again, I don't think the unions get as much recognition as they deserve. Um, I listened to your scale a few weeks ago with Owen uh Reedy, Owen Reedy was it? Owen Reedy. Um and the, the last the last 15 minutes of his his session, I just thought everybody needs to hear that. Everybody should hear what he has to say has to say and rights are so important and people don't realize how much rights they actually have um and the unions are there to support and step in and i was very very lucky to have the into back me up one of the things i'm quite interested in and you'll know the answer to this automatically you're not a flash in the pan and i mean that with the greatest respect your mother and father but mostly your mother pushed all of the children your brothers your brother and your sisters to educate right and to do i think you have a sister who's a barrister is that is that right marie john's a barrister marie is a solicitor solicitor right i mean that's a remarkable story uh, from a working class family and a socially deprived area and i don't mean this in a derogatory way but there was never a lot of money your father kept the family going by delivering Chinese at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You rode shotgun with them. You looked I out the windows so. and pointed out the numbers of the houses. Yeah, I, I was a runner. I used to run in and bring the Chinese. <laughs> but the deal was I, I got to keep the tips. <laughs> um, and, you know, again, that instilled in is also a great work ethic because we understood you had to work hard if you wanted the finer things or the nicer things. We're all socialists, like, you know, even though we've, we've done well, there would be that sort of at our core. You want a better society. Kathy's leading social prescribing over in Liverpool. Um, you know, we, we, we were told you need to be educated and education equals power, not in a way where you can abu be abusive, but in a way where you can, you know, help and pull other people up the ladder with you. But again, reading was so, something that was encouraged. Schoolwork was encouraged. Um, we were never put under pressure, Joe. Like, they never 
stood over us and it just sort of happened, if that makes sense. Martin sort of led example. Then yeah. it was like a domino effect. Um, and although Niall is a drummer, uh, Niall actually made it to university, but he just, he just, it wasn't for him, you know. So all six of us got there. Yeah. So for my mummy and daddy, like a clinger and a security guard, they did all right, like. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. And part of the whole the whole purpose of Skelta is that we, we, and you pointed it out earlier on, and you do it consistently. We come from a society, a working class society that's been vilified by sections of the media and vilified by certain political parties. But, but your story, and my own family story, I have to say, and many, many others, is that given the opportunities, given the drive, given the resources, that we're clever. And not, not clever, yeah. to, as you say, to exploit other people, but clever in our own right. Your poetry, and I know your poetry is very precious to you. <laughs> I was asking someone, I, I'm trying to word this so that you don't know who I've been talking to, but I was asking someone about <laughs> when you first started writing poetry, and they said, you know, she was writing poetry for a long time before anybody knew that she'd even done it. So yeah. was poetry something that you'd done as a child, a teenager, an adult, or was it something that you developed uh, as you, you got a wee bit older? So I did English literature for my A-level, and whenever I returned after having own, my English teacher gave me the poem And Still I Raise by Maya Angelou. Oh. I always loved reading poetry. Um, the reason that it's been the main source of what I've been writing, it's... Like I would write a poem in five minutes and because of the ME, I have very short cognition. I have very short attention span. And so poetry is the easiest thing for me to write. And like I've been doing that group, Fergal Enright set up this writing group during the pandemic. And I mean, these people are some of the most talented people I've ever met. They are, I feel so humbled they have been in that group with them. Like the, the pandemic opened up so many doors, but it's it being around like minded people. We did it via Zoom. Um, and Fergal managed to put all these people together who have different backgrounds. Some people like myself had cancer or um, you know, health battles, others were dealing with bereavement or grief. And um it it just whatever he did, it was just a, an amazing 12 weeks. And I'm so grateful because those people have helped me and I hope that I've helped them by sharing our stories and our anthology is going to be presented next week at the Fela, you know, so just very being cool. part of that, that, that type of social prescribing is so very important. And when the pandemic is over, I hope that people realize that the arts is a way of coping and it should be nurtured and funded. And this type of, um, you know, treating the community for well-being as opposed to waiting for something bad to happen. This should be happening anyway. And like when I think of the the people in that group, it's a fellow, Scott McKendry from the Shankle. Yes. He has been brilliant. And like I've learned so much from him, but it's just been like such an uplifting experience. I've also been reading one poem a week for Eamon Molly, who yeah. again, I never knew Eamon. Eamon has been on the phone. He's been so kind and generous with his time. He's encouraged me. He's the people that he's linked me with are people who understand poetry and know a lot about it, and they're encouraging me. And when you've been very, very sick, that sort of little nudge in in the right direction can really be, you know, a massive boost to your confidence and self esteem when you've sort of struggled in silence and in isolation. Well, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. I think that encouragement gets the best out of us all. And as you know and I know, but I don't say it very often, men are children. All men are children, even the ones who don't admit that they're children. And to say to somebody, that's well done, even though and even when the shelf on the wall is crooked, just to say, yeah, that's okay. I think it gets the best out of people. Did, did lockdown, did it frighten you? And I know you had been through your own personal lockdown. So did, did, did the COVID lockdown, was it, did it have memories of bringing you back to a place you don't want to be back in? Yeah, Joe, um, I've been in intensive care. I've been on, um, you know, a ventilator. 
Um, I've had MRSA and C. diff. So if I get something, I'm in big trouble. And I know that. So the very first lockdown, Damien was the only person that left the house. There was nobody else, you know, allowed in or out. And the kids were very strict and everything was done to the sa- like the safest um, manner. But it, my life started to improve because I had Damien and the kids there every day. I had round the clock care. And so I wasn't isolated or lonely. Loneliness is a terrible, terrible thing. And somebody like me who had worked all my life and always been around people and love, I love being around people. I love talking and you know that anyway. <laughs> but, um, me too, it's just me too. Have, have, having them there. And then as I say, things like Skelta, the FELA programs moving online. I did a course with Pete Charlo, um, at prior to Christmas. All these opportunities opened up reading for him and Molly being involved with Fergal and all of a sudden you feel like you're involved in life again for the first time in many years and it was all down to the the Conley Centre podcast that I did for Kleena. Harry contacted me and said would you mind doing a 15 minute um, podcast and that literally has catapulted me like in such a positive direction. It's amazing. Well the Conley Centre, and I'm associated with the Conley Centre, I'm associated with Fiala. We'll take responsibility for anything, as you know. Uh, <laughs> but we can't take responsibility for you. You were, you, were, you were fighting your corner before any of this. Uh, I, I want to ask you just in terms of, and then I want to come back to where, nearly to where we are. And I, I'm very appreciative of you taking time out of your holiday. I know I know your holiday is something very precious to you. When you're not writing poetry, uh, uh, and when you're not fighting with, with shock jocks, when you're not kicking the TV <laughs> or shouting at the TV, Damien says he'd never buy an expensive TV because he's scared of you throwing a stool. <laughs> um, how do you, as you mentioned the flowers that you can see. So how do you relax? How do you kind of, just kick off the heels. Yeah, Joe, music. Uh, I, I try to listen to music to raise the vibrations. Um, I meditate. I'm mindful of everything I'm doing. So mindfulness just keeps you in the present moment. And one of the things that I found really hard for those first four years of this illness was my mind was constantly attacking me, making me feel worthless, making me feel hopeless. And I had to sort of go back what you're saying, like being like a child. I had to actually retrain my brain to be childlike, to find wonder and awe all around you. Should it be looking at the clouds? Should it be looking at a blade of grass? Should it be the trees, smells, bees? Just everything about nature is so restorative. And so, again, instead of watching things that lower your vibrations and wind you up, I started, like, saturating myself with things that lift you. And, uh, like, Disney... I would have sat, see, for the eight and a half months that I was in the bed, I would say that I watched The Lion King nearly every day and I sobbed and cried. I allowed trauma to come up and and I dealt with that trauma and I learned to let it go because I think I was repressing a lot of trauma from previous hospital experiences. And um, what I had never done was actually address the fact that I've been through a lot. I just kept pushing on. And so meditation has been like unbelievably um, enlightening. So I think that I've found a way of coping through mindfulness, meditation, and just breathing, Joe, just sitting in silence, which for me was very, very hard to do. <laughs> it, took, it took a long time and it takes great practice. You have to be disciplined and you have to believe that this is going to help you because there's so much literature out there saying this is going to help you. But whenever I was told by psychologists, you need to do this, you need to do that, I wasn't ready to heal. I was so angry and bitter and felt hard done by that I my career was in, that I worked so hard. And every day I was yapping and I didn't like being a victim. I didn't like the poor me. I didn't like what I'd become um, because it was a moan. Even though I had plenty of reason to moan, I, sh- I didn't like being that type of a person. I want to be somebody that when you leave me, you feel better instead of, feeling downbeat or negative or you know what I mean that one you want to lift people up not bring them down I have to defend you you, you weren't the moon I mean I I've, <laughs> I've spoken to a number of people that 
when we were getting ready for this conversation, and not one of them, not one of them said that you were a moment. So I mean, give yourself a wee bit of credit. The Chinese have a great expression that sometimes people don't accept a gift. The gift is a present, and they don't accept a gift, and and they find that you know when you say them well done like you, they go, oh, well, it was nothing. It was nothing. But it was a whole lot. And, and we've skipped over quite a lot in this conversation. And I have to say, to bring you back to where we were, where, I mean, on a number of occasions in your life, it nearly ended. It was nearly over. It wasn't that, you know, when I have a sore head, I, I'm critically ill. That's just me, right? Mm -hmm. But you were nearly, you know, family and friends were saying, see ya, you're, you're nearly away. So, so you need to give yourself a wee bit of credit. You're a great supporter of Phila and always have been a great supporter of Phila. And, and um, attended, when you could, you attended as many events as you possibly could. Phila's around the corner. You've got, you've got, a, you've got an event in Phila. So tell us a wee bit about that. So, Joe, the group that Fergal had put together, um, it was actually through Gl Glornamona. And they've composed an anthology of our poetry and just being part of that, you know, these people, their journeys have inspired me so much and their encouragement has lifted me so much. And I hope that they feel lifted by the experiences as much as I have. So that is going to happen up in Glornamona. There's going to be a native celebration of our poetry. Yeah. I've also been really lucky. I was a bit slow at getting some tickets, but I've got one for uh -huh. Kai Kiki and Jerry Adams at the Rock Bar. So yeah. I'm really, really looking forward to that um, because I think there was limited, very limited numbers. Um, so uh, there's a lot going on. Um, I've spoke to Harry about talking about rights and maybe uh, now Murphy has done um, great engagement with all the GAA clubs about Ireland's future. And I think that our children need to be engaged in that conversation as much as the adults do. And so if there's going to be civic assemblies or citizens assemblies, I think the children need to play their part in that. And I'm really glad Aoife's involved and Sinn Féin, she's an activist. You know, she's got involved in politics. Owen's got his first job. So hopefully the kids go out there and the things that I can't physically get myself involved in, they'll live my dreams for me. This, this interview, this discussion, this conversation, it lost an hour. And we're 55 minutes into the hour. And I have to say, every minute of it's been enjoyable. For the future, do you have plans? To, are, there, are, there, are there things that are attainable that you want to do but haven't got around them? I know you want to climb the Black Mountain. You're not going to, I have to tell you. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But are there, are, uh -huh. are there, are there, there's more poetry. There is a book. I know there's a book somewhere about you, uh, about mm -hmm. your journey. But is there other things that, that you need to give us warning for coming down the lane? Joe, do, do you know what? Each day as it comes, try and be happy for whatever I have. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm up here in Bally Castle, getting down to the beach in the car or got up to the forest. It just lifts you. So at the minute, I'm, I'm scribbling away. I don't know if anything will come from it, but I, I believe, I believe that something will. I'm hoping that something will. Um, and if, if these words maybe help one person, you know, who might be struggling, then it's worth putting yourself out there. You know, one of the biggest things when you've had ill health is your confidence suffers. You, doubts come riding in like a band of thieves. You know, you, your mind tries to tell you you're not worth it or you, you don't deserve these opportunities. But do you know what, Joe? You, you do. Everybody deserves to continue to have a happy life, no yeah. matter what suffering that they're enduring. And so it's about transcending suffering for me. It's about finding joy in every aspect of life. It's about seeing the kids develop and success. Uh, Damien, he just won a final last week there. He's taken carried off seniors. And, and Joe, we're saying this is a, a joke about him being a hero, but like he can't get enough of hurling. So he's taken the under 13s at our own club and he's taken carried off and he, he's <laughs> in with Gail Foster in the day. So, um, He's happy seeing him, um, you know, back doing what he loves and, and maybe the kids being able to step in as young curs to alleviate him from the responsibility. 
it just makes you feel happy that you're not a burden. I, I don't know. I don't know. Nobody's ever told me I'm a burden, but you do feel like that at times. And so it's about just being as happy as I can possibly be and spreading that joy through poetry if I can. This might surprise you, and uh, it shouldn't, but it might surprise you, that when we talked about we talked about you to your ones, right? <laughs> individually and I think collectively, the, the hero in their lives was you. You were the person that they were describing as the hero. And now we find ourselves describing everybody, including the patrolman across the street outside the front door as a hero, but but everybody described you as a hero. I know that, you know? well, <clears throat> I know that through all the diversity and all and all of the difficulties that you had, you, you've never lost your love of West Belfast. You've never lost your sense of humor. You've never lost your ability to fight and to argue and to have an opinion and to hold it strongly. <laughs> We're in our last two minutes, just we're going to finish off, unfortunately, but we're going to finish off. And, and you talked about the power of writing and you talked about the destructive nature of isolation, of, of lying in a bed or being locked in a room or being locked in where, wherever you may be. And I said somewhere during this last hour, you don't give advice. And I know you don't give advice. And, and, I, and I'm going to ask you to break a habit of a lifetime. If there's someone that's watching the program or someone who knows somebody and is watching the program, what is there one piece of advice you would say to them, tell them to do what? What would it be? Joe, no matter how dark it seems to get, the dawn will always come. So just know that better times are on their way. And whatever hardship or suffering or whatever battle you're dealing with, it's temporary. Things do change. And so whatever you're feeling at any given moment, allow, surrender yourself to it and allow it to pass because it will pass. And there's always joy. You'll always find joy in something, in a child's smile, in laughter, in a flower, in a program, in music. There are ways to find that there's always a way out. There's always a way out. And that's what I would say. This is the last, last, last question. Are you still disco dancing in bed? Yep, still wiggling the toes, <laughs> Joe, if that's all I can do. Um, and, you know, I, that was something that the, the doctors used to say to me when I was in for 13 weeks. If you just wiggle that toe, you know, because I couldn't do much. Um, so whenever I'm in the bed, I just I put the music on. If I can do a wee bit of movement, I'll do it. If I can't, I'll just lie there and pretend the arm. I'll dance in my head. Um, that's a quote I'm going to use. I'm dancing. I, let me get. Let me give you one quote. It's from a, a Zimbabwean woman who is a poet, and she says in one of her and I can't remember the name of the book, and she says, "If you can talk, you can sing, and if you can walk, you can dance, and you're the proof of that." So for being for being in conversation with me for disrupting your holiday, don't go hunting all the people who were talking to us because I get it. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be telling me you <laughs> shouldn't have said to her. But for being a wonderful guest, for having a great conversation, for being an inspiration. Goramila Mayogat, thank you. For Mayogat, Joe, um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to just enjoy, as I say, I'm a super fan. So for Mayogat.